Robin Hood, Bloody Mary, Paul Bunyan. You may know these characters from pictures, books, songs, movies, or those conversations around the campfire. And they're examples of folklore, ghost lore, and fake lore. In today's session, we'll explore these areas. Welcome to Dope Content. I'm Laura Bergels, and with me is co-host Scott Smith. And our special guest today is Lisa Grimm. And Lisa directs digital asset management, taxonomy, and content programs in the US and Europe. Since the mid 90s, she's worked for museums and archives, including women.com, Nature Publishing Group, Drexel University College of Medicine, GSK, Amazon, and many more. She currently leads worldwide dam initiatives at Novartis from their Dublin office. And of course, Lisa co-hosts the Beer Ladies podcast. And my first question is the giant in the room. Lisa, <laughs> since you're here to talk about folklore and fake lore, we can't ignore that your last name is Grimm, as in the Brothers Grimm. And they were big folklore archivists in their day. So is there a family connection? Funnily enough, there is, but not as you would expect, because of course nothing can be straightforward, can it? So it turns out there is a very complicated family connection, not coming sort of straight down through the, the grim line as it were, but it turns out one of their, let's see, hang on, let me get the, the sort of genealogical math right. So their mother's family was actually related to my mother's family back in Germany, which means that somehow distantly my parents were sort of distant cousins without ever knowing it, but that is actually how the, the connection got in there. So the otherwise that the Grimm surname itself was just sort of a, a lucky coincidence, if you like. But I do think, you know, you have sort of that nominative determinism in there. I do think it sort of led me down that path. I was always fascinated with um, certainly the, you know, their, uh, their, uh, kinder and household tales and all of the sort of fairy tales, folklore, uh, you know, folk songs, all that kind of thing that they documented uh, was always stuff I was fascinated with. So there's, you know, it's probably a little bit of that, that sort of uh, kernel, if you like. How do you distinguish between or among um, uh, folklore, ghost lore and fake lore? Uh, really good question. And, and I have next to me this whole sort of I'll show you a few of them. I have all these lovely books here that I can sort of put in your in your show notes later for, ooh, some of them are ghost books. Some of them are sort of academic folklore books. Uh, what, what I think is interesting though is that fake lore um, is kind of having its own, um, it's sort of living its best life at the moment, if you like, on the internet for a lot of reasons. It's different from fake news, but you know, the thing with the fake lore is where you get people thinking, oh, of course I know that. So my, my favorite examples are things like people think that Ring Around the Rosie has something to do with the plague. It has nothing to do with the plague. You know, it's, it's not even, uh, it doesn't even appear in print until, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years after any major plague outbreak. But because it feels like, of course it would be there, you know, and people like to sort of read this kind of, um, I would say sort of sinister feeling into most sort of uh, traditional children's rhymes and stories because they are pretty creepy. Like a lot of them are, you know, very strange and, you know, have something terrible happen at the end. So people always sort of assume they know that that's what happened. But that was one of the things in my first folklore class in, uh, as an undergraduate, actually, that is the first thing they say, no, this is not true. There's no connection here. Here's the actual academic sourcing for it. Here's, you know, here's here you go read it. But, you know, unless you take that sort of class, you're not going to get that kind of debunking. So that you get sort of that kind of thing where people just feel like it must be right because it's got this sort of um, scary intonation and that sort of, uh, it just feels creepy. But I, I think the one that's been um, sort of bugging me in the last week or so is that you've seen this thing circulating on, on the internet about how, um, how women brewers, brewsters, are the sort of origin of, of sort of witch iconography and so on. It's completely untrue. And anyone who sort of takes the time to, to unpack it uh, or who knows enough really about medieval history and what some of these archetypes are, will know instantly that's not true. So we actually did a podcast debunking it a few months ago, but it comes up again and again, because again, it feels right. There are enough things that look like they would cross over and you think, ah, well, of course, you know, these women were disenfranchised, which is true. And again, you get these little nuggets of things that were true, but then you sort of paint on top of them things that are sort of really just fantastical and that you're like, no, there's no evidence for this. And so you have to kind of go in and 
you know, prick, prick some uh, balloons if you like, but, but, but then there's some that are totally innocent and just kind of lovely. I don't know if you know the story of Lucy Lightfoot, which people thought was sort of the, the true story of a time slip that uh, happened in the 1920s or 30s. I forget exactly when, but in that, in that time period, it's a beautiful little story. Again, happy to, to link it in your show notes somewhere, but it was just written by the vicar of the local church in the 1960s or 70s to sort of drum up interest in tourism. It was very innocent. It was all just sort of, wouldn't it be fun if people had a story to associate with this place? But it gets then published again and again and again in sort of your, um, again, I'm just going to pick up one of my, my books here, your sort of true local ghost stories uh, sort of collections uh, as a thing that actually happened. Um, and again, you can put any air quotes around that, but it's, it's fascinating how these things that were maybe printed for one sort of, uh, you know, sort of written and printed for one specific occasion, then sort of get out into the, the universe. And then you look at things like creepy pasta, where, you know, all these things have come out of that, that had no basis in sort of traditional folklore, uh, your slender man, your sort of black eyed children, things like that, which are great stories, but people think they must have been around for hundreds of years, because they have that sort of weight to them and that feeling, but they're brand new and that's okay. It just means they're a different thing. So they're fake lore, but they're, they're great stories. So it's still, it's about what's that thing that people connect to. There's something about the storytelling element that people just relate to. So they want to have this sort of, uh, sort of antiquity to it, even if it's not there. Is there a case to be made for marketers and website owners to start creating their own folk stories and scare stories? That's, you know, it's a great question. And every now and then I, I feel like in the kind of the early SEO days, kind of, you know, when people would sort of set up websites and have sort of deep links to things that didn't exist before, but it would look like they did. And now it's easier to sort of say, okay, no, we can see when this was actually registered and so on and so forth. It's, it's harder to do, but I do think there is a lot there in terms of sort of you know, brand storytelling, people have gotten much more sophisticated at that, but you do also see them, and I've seen this especially kind of in in, uh, in the spirits industry, sort of whiskey and bourbon especially, will sort of develop an entirely new origin story for themselves. And there may be some bit that's true, but other people, I think, especially in the industry, will call it out and say, well, okay, no, this wasn't your story 15 years ago. Why is it now? Did you find something new or did you just kind of make this up? And often they did just kind of make it up, but at the same time, this is why brands should absolutely be using their historic archives if they have one and really just uh, you know, make sure that those are well-funded because that, that is the well to keep drawing from if you are a long-standing business or if you would like to be a long-standing business, you know, way to go. Definitely something to use there. Now, what of scare lore? <laughs> it's, it, yeah, so, so I love anything to do with, with ghosts, like I, I love sort of the paranormal in general, even though I am a 100% confirmed skeptic, I'm not a believer in anything. I believe that people experience things and interpreted them this particular way, but uh, whether it's, you know, sort of um, your, your cryptids, your sort of Bigfoot and everything, or uh, ghosts are really the one I get excited about. I, I just love kind of the, the interesting continuities you get in, in ghost stories and the things that change about them over time too. So if you, for example, you read, uh, and I'm going to, I'm going to get up another example here. I have this, what I'm going to call sort of the mid-century modern approach to it. I have this, this gorgeous book here called that ghost that I saw from the 1950s and the way people, and these are, you know, famous people because these are, you know, ghosts appearing to people like Noel Coward, um, you know, sort of Mae West, Burl Ives, uh, the way the, they sort of appear is very different to what happens on sort of your, your kind of paranormal TV shows now. It's just a completely different experience. And some of it you can sort of trace back to sort of Charles Dickens or M.R. James in terms of sort of creating the modern ghost story and kind of the template that, that people sort of have now. But I, I, I just love this kind of thing. I, and again, I love the bits that sort of are... Uh, I would say sort of legitimately not easily explainable, like your sort of poltergeist, your, your geth the mongoose, all of those things that, uh, you know, you want to sort of, sort of unpack like why though are, are people experiencing these things or why are they interpreting them this way, all, all of that. But I, I do also just sort of love something about, you know, the, the good kind of, and again, air quotes here, sort of true ghost story. I, I like that sort of bit around, uh, you know, what is the sort of personal experience that people felt they had to relate or kind of felt they couldn't relate because they might be seen as sort of crazy or, you know, whatever. But uh, I, I do love too how they're different sort of cross-culturally, although again, lots of similarities, but if, for example, here's a Hawaiian one. The Hawaiian ones have their own flavor to them. They are very much about I picked up Madame Pele as a hitchhiker. There's, you know, very, very different from kind of your other 
phantom hitchhiker type stories. They've got very much their local flavor and it's just beautiful. Now, wait a minute. You use the phrase Geth the Mongoose and I think we need to back up a little bit. <laughs> what is Geth the Mongoose? What so is the for story those, of Geth? <laughs> for those not in the know, because you know who doesn't know Geth the Mongoose? Um, and, and I know Scott, you're a big Geth fan. Uh, so in, in the 1950s, Geth or Jeff, depending on your pronunciation, it was spelled G-E-F, uh, was a sort of poltergeist spirit mongoose that appeared to a, a young girl living uh, on the Isle of Man, you know, quite isolated. Uh, he would come and be quite rude. He would shout things. He would bang on walls, all the kind of typical sort of poltergeist activity. But the fun difference is that in this case, we were told that it was a talking mongoose. You know, sort of a spiritual talking mongoose that did all of these things. I, I, I mean, why not? You know, so it's but it's a fascinating case in terms of, again, why why a mongoose? <laughs> you know, there's a lot to unpack there, and uh, again, just sort of the way it was investigated and the way you know people really did want to believe. You know, very sort of early X Files, but it's a uh, it's really really interesting. Just again in terms of that the why this and um, and then again certainly the uh, arguments over how you pronounce the name. Again, G E F. You think. Well, it must be Jeff, right? But no, it's Gif. So I think Scott, you, you've got a good point around GIF versus GIF. It's uh, it, it's very much that. But there are some really good books about the case that that are just again fascinating. And uh, you know, it, it's again there's this bit around. Um, you do have these similarities that are so interesting in these cases of sort of teenage girl, typically girl, sometimes boy, but usually girl, you know, sort of maybe the rest of the family has some kind of turmoil, but sometimes they don't. And it's just kind of what what drives this kind of attention and why does it sort of um, happen this way? Like why, why this? And again, why a mongoose in this case? So it's just fascinating what, to me. What in your opinion makes one tale work and spread and really capture people's attention like that, like Jeff? Um, yeah, it's- it Some of those details. And then others will fizzle and they go nowhere. Yeah, it's a really great question. And, and you think of, you know, certainly the, some of those more modern ones you were talking about earlier, sort of Slender Man, Black Eyed Children. I think it's how, one of the things that helps them spread is it can be so kind of universal. And it's, it's like any good urban legend. Oh, it, it happened to a friend of a friend or my cousin's boyfriend had X happen. And as long as you can sort of just keep moving the story, it's it's got legs. So it's... Uh, as long as, it, and it doesn't even have to seem, you know, plausible by most standards of plausible, it just has to kind of fit the pattern. So I think that's the other fascinating thing about these kind of stories is what, what is the pattern and how does it shift over time or sort of how does it shift kind of cross-culturally? Because a lot of these will kind of just sort of move across different, um, you know, different eras, different people. And uh, you get some of these same kind of little tent poles that are, that are kind are of they? Uh, what, what, always there. People who are crafting these stories what are those patterns that we should be looking for as we craft our own folklore and fairy tales? Oh, it, it's, what's you know, I think make that story stick and spread. Yeah, it's what's the hook, you know, what's going to appeal to people where they can really kind of put themselves into the story, right? So it's like, oh, I could see this happening to me, whether it's me now or me when I was 13 or, you know, whatever. It's, it's how can you sort of plant some of those seeds, you know, in the back of the mind? I, I think it's, you know, the sort of the universality of them is is probably the the appeal, but it's, you know, it's the, there is the sort of mix of having sort of uncertainty, but also, you know, wanting to turn the page and find out what happens next. You know, you want to kind of keep people guessing. I, I think there's a, an element there kind of laying down breadcrumbs that, again, maybe have a sort of um, clear through line, but, you know, maybe then something surprising happens at the end, but you need to get people on the journey, I think, to get them excited. So yeah, have a hook in there. Do we want to be fooled or are we looking for those clues so that we can say, aha, they tried to fool me, but I wasn't. <laughs> oh, it's, it's a delicate balance, isn't it? And, we, and certainly you've seen brands go the wrong way on, on April Fool's Day on occasion. I mean, and I feel like nobody did it last year with COVID just because everyone's like, no, nah, which was good. You didn't want people putting out crazy stuff in kind of a time like this, but uh, I, I, to me, I always kind of like the ones where you get kind of a paragraph or two in and then you're like, oh, this is just really funny. Good job. When, when you really like the kind of level of detail they've gone into. But then, uh, you know, you, you also have to kind of walk that line, too, because everyone's always, you know, come across the, some of those April Fool's things like, oh, it's just offensive or no, it's not funny or, or it's so, you know, sort of um, dark almost that you're like, oh, no, we don't want to go there. So there is a balance, but it's it's hard if you can do it right, though. I think it's uh, it's a lot of fun. Well, you've inspired me. I think as a writer, what I need to do is uh, write uh, uh, some 
fairy tales and folklore for different organizations. Absolutely. And, and, you know, I think it's interesting because, you know, you've got a framework for them, right? You kind of, you know, know the, the kind of highlights of some of those stories. So you can, you know, you've, you've at least got something to work with as a template. And again, it's one people recognize, even if it's sort of subconscious, you can just kind of follow that, uh, that sort of trail, uh, you know, into the forest, as it were, and see where that goes. There was a story we used to call the, I went to a ninth grade only um, high school. And then through a 10th through 12th high school. But when I was in ninth grade, the principal was called Milkshake behind his back. The story was that the quarterback on the freshman football team had gotten up on the roof of the school and threw a milkshake from the cafeteria at him. And so many kids claimed that they saw it. And they said, yeah, <laughs> Snake, because all quarterbacks in the 70s were named Snake. Right. And, um, but uh, when we get to the 10th grade school, the juniors by that time weren't even talking about it anymore because they thought they had invented that happened oh yeah freshmen. the seniors thought that it happened when they were freshmen again it was the quarterback the class always prior to me and the one before yeah. that my brother went to school there four years after i did and still called they still called him milkshake but the origin story was their freshman quarterback oh how funny yeah, but that's the thing is it's always the same pattern oh, yeah yeah exactly but um i mean most of the stuff you uh you pick up you know when you're young anyway and you know even now but it was when i was a kid it was always um my friend's cousin or my cousin's friend <laughs> but you can't say that uh, with your family so you have to say a kid in my class it right. happened and things like that and you know now on Facebook you know it's like uh, your great aunt or great uncle uh, <laughs> uh, shared in 93 percent of the people that get the vaccine have this happened to them or, right. or what have you that's why I'm not on Facebook anyway. and, and you brings up a good point is that close friend of a friend or that family connection important to the spread is that one of the <sighs> template elements you know, and I think in a lot of ways, certainly social media has hastened some of these things along, like things that would have taken, you know, months, years, whatever to, to spread to sort of more organically really have, especially you think about things that maybe exactly you heard going to high school or at camp where you, it might've taken a very long time for these to evolve. They, it's so fast now that it can go from something someone wrote as a fun story four years ago to now we've made a film about this because this is just sort of known kind of folklore that that people just already can can sort of hook into and feel like they just know and again all, you know look at the x-files too something like that you know a lot of those sort of archetypes weren't necessarily known by normals <laughs> but you know all, all us nerds kind of got what they were doing but uh you know a, a lot of these things are you know changed really slowly but now they go really quickly so it's it's a really interesting question in terms of how does that that sort of, you know, um, oh, what's the, the word, the sort of loose connection, if you like, help spread that along. And, and you know, arguably now it's it's just so much faster. What's that, what's folklore, or fake lore, what's that going to look like in 50 years, 100 years or so? Been thinking, or at least I've been thinking with sort of, you know, we're in a pandemic, that's when all your folklore gets created, right? But then you sort of unpack it, <laughs> it, it kind of doesn't, because people don't want to think about it. I mean, you think about, you know, did we hear all of these sort of ghost stories arising from, say, the Spanish flu? Not really. So is it just that there was this sort of collective desire to be like, oh, we're not, let's not think about that. Or, you yeah, know, let's or, not talk about uh, deceased people for a while. Is probably yeah, exactly. Sure. So it's, it, it's really interesting sort of which of those things are still kind of, if you like, no, too soon, or if, if you know, the, there is something to kind of come out of that. But I think that's something that, that I was thinking about not too long ago, is it really struck me that we don't have stories about, oh, and, and, you know, my great grandmother wore all these masks for a year, you know, dur during that, like, it, it's almost like there was nothing. So that's obviously going to be different because we document everything and we sort of talk so much. We're so present now on it. But at the same time, like, you know, next year, we're not going to be like, remember how we were wearing masks? You know, hopefully we'll be all like, no, we're on a beach. We're not going to, you know, we're not going to go there. But it's, it's interesting. Like, what, what do people want to remember? Because people want to remember some of this sort of, or think they remember this sort of darker stuff. But at the same time, it's like, well, but a lot of it's been sort of transmuted into something more kind of accessible or, or sort of more palatable. So I think there's there's something there in terms of what will those stories look like? I feel like they're not going to be anything like our our current reality. People will come up with something new and, and a lot more fun, hopefully, in terms of spreading some of those. So we'll see. Some of the iconography from the plague, though, remains and sort of Absolutely. us because... I'm sure it didn't spread during that time, but you remember they wore the masks with the beaks and so forth. Yeah. And I'm wondering if future scare lore and ghost lore 
might be 500,000 people rose from the dead all wearing masks. And oh, who knows? Really yeah. horrible right now. But um, you're looking at movies and television shows and holograms going forward. <laughs> that might be uh, another element of the scare. What, yeah. what is the future of scare lore? It's a really good question. And it's funny too, because what, one of my kids was a plague doctor for Halloween a couple of years ago, because ha ha, what, what could be funnier than that? But uh, yeah, you, you look at it now and you're like, huh. But it, it's interesting. Yeah, it, it's like, what's going to be that one image that's sort of so uh, ingrained? Because there were other things that were at least sort of, uh, even during the early modern period that were absolutely like, people looked at that were like, oh, plague. And we don't have those as much, like sort of the like dance macabre and things like that, that unless you kind of are in the know or have studied this you don't immediately connect the two but to you know to those audiences that was absolutely part and parcel of that kind of iconography and we kind of just didn't pick that part up maybe for, for whatever reason um but it's it's a really good question is you know what are going to be those those future things and I think it's we can look back a little again sort of some of the things that have sort of succeeded if you like from creepypasta where they have that element of like government conspiracy or aliens or, you know whatever is sort of the the current thing that's sort of making people nervous that they don't quite want to articulate it's uh you know it's in there so i'm sure we'll have you know eventually sort of you know vaccine related you know uh zombies or, or whatever you know it, it's going to be something that'll you know be a kind of a reaction to this time but it'll have again, sort of like, like a virus itself will have mutated into something else. So you'd have to, you know, future researchers will have to unpack and be like, oh, these people all went crazy then. And this is how it eventually came out. So. I need to get the Bloody Mary as much oh. as you can get us about Bloody Mary. <laughs> uh, Bloody Mary is fascinating. So I, again, I'm, I'm going to sort of reference this delightful book here. And I know it's sort of a, a little bit, um, it's a little bit, uh, got a little bit of a glare on it. So haunting experiences, ghosts and contemporary folklore. And the, the reason I love this book is they've, um, you know, first of all, it's a lot of different academics kind of talking about these things, but they really go through and kind of unpack how the, the Bloody Mary so, sort of story, and I'll get back to sort of what we mean by that, but how it relates to what they call this sort of deviant femme, um, which sounds like a shop I would have gone to in the 80s, but uh, the, the sort of deviant femme, um, sort of archetype persona and they they link her her through sort of Bloody Mary uh, and and then to um, La Llorona uh, so the sort of Mexican version and how they sort of link up together how, how they have got a lot in common and then they actually tie it uh, back together to uh, Sarah Winchester who built the Winchester Mystery House for anyone in California but it's fascinating how they've sort of got these two things that are sort of um, you know, stories you tell children effectively and then tying it into the kind of um, sort of legend trip experience that people have when they go to a place like the Winchester Mystery House. And I've got a good story that's going to tie that back together at the end. But if you sort of look at how, how I would have learned Bloody Mary, you would have sort of gone into a bathroom with other girls of the same age. I would have been probably seven or eight when I first picked it up. And, you know, you close your eyes and then you say Bloody Mary's name the right number of times. The right number is going to vary depending on where you are and you know, all kinds of things. 13 is what I've seen most recently, but I'm like, we didn't have time for that in my day. It was like three, you get, you know, you get in and out. And then she appears in the mirror when you open your eyes and everyone screams and ah. But what's what's interesting to me is kind of that the origin has, um, you know, when you ask children and which is what they did in this book, sort of ask the usually now adults, but remembering their, their sort of childhood, like, why was she in the mirror? Like, what was happening in there? You know, it was usually that she was being punished for something. She was either too vain or she had killed someone or she she was trying too hard to protect her baby, which is actually sort of what links her to the, the Mexican version. Uh, again, it's not quite a one-to-one, -one, but there's this bit around, um, and, and this is why they sort of categorize her as a sort of deviant femme because she's too feminine. She does too many things that are sort of expectations of gender. But of course, you know, children aren't unpacking all of this if they're, you know, seven, eight, nine, this is just, a fun thing they're told to do and it's been sort of handed down and it does have sort of antecedents in if you look at Halloween sort of traditions from the night the early 1900s 1910s 1920s they're all about divination and finding out who's going to be your partner and um as much as again we'd like these things to have this kind of deep prehistory they kind of don't so they tend to be sort of Victorian to Edwardian ish 
But again, it feels like something that would have happened a long time ago. So it's yeah. still that idea there. But it's it's interesting that, you know, they there's the sort of bit around sort of focusing on the kind of most gendered, if you like, aspects. And as, you know, kids who are probably, you know, sort of tweens are just kind of on the verge of figuring out what all this stuff means. It's just kind of there in their brains and trying to unpack it all. But how, how it sort of comes back to um, Sarah Winchester is is she's this woman who is building this crazy big house and, you know, sort of for ghostly reasons, but not really. If you actually go back and, and read anything for real written about Sarah Winchester, this was all sort of stuff, you know, created from whole cloth when they wanted to create a sort of tourist attraction as yes, she did have seances and stuff like that, but really she was a woman employing a lot of people in the area, which was kind of, again, not normal. She was you know, effectively running a business. So for her time, that was mm, a little strange. And so this, this sort of, you know, got her this reputation as sort of an eccentric and again, sort of deviant, um, if you like, as in the sort of, you know, language of the, the sort of language of the academy, if you like. But what I find so interesting about that and then sort of how, how these were sort of tacked on effectively as, as a, you know, marketing gimmick is that, uh, but the, the real life Sarah Winchester um, had a personal physician whose name was Dr. Euthanasia Mead. Now, Dr. Euthanasia Mead was a, a woman doctor. She had graduated from the Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania in uh, yeah, I want to say in around 1888, uh, and I only know this because I used to work at the Drexel University College of Medicine archives. She was a graduate, so we had all of their papers. Dr. Euthanasia Mead, to bring it back to sort of nominative determinism, wrote her thesis on death. So it's just the sort of beautiful tying everything together, uh, but she did eventually move out to California, became Sarah Winchester's personal physician, and is weirdly though never mentioned in any of these stories even though i'm like guys it's right there for you you know come on but so tip for you future say marketers. the word euthanasia mead and i'm like no no that's all and made up that, that cannot be right her real name it's yeah we've got uh you know back at my old uh my old employer wonderful wonderful people they have her thesis in the archives you can it's online you can read it and it's uh yes you could say you know, euthanasia mead thesis on death and it's just like oh, it's it's all right there. So sometimes again, it's real life can be just as weird as folklore. I have never done Bloody Mary. You have. I have. What did you see? Nothing. So it was it was very disappointing. I know some people will, you know, get the the sort of sort of lights if you like in their eyes, like that you might get if you hold your eyes tight, you know, really tightly closed. But when you're with two or three other kids, they all say, I saw it, I saw it, I saw it. You have to see it too. Otherwise, you don't want to be the, the odd one out. So everyone has to say they saw something. So I, I think uh, I was never terribly successful at, at Bloody Mary, but you also get sort of the, the other things around it. You're sort of light as a feather, stiff as a board, and some of these other kinds of things where you say, no, no, I saw someone levitate. Absolutely. But, you know, you get into that whole group think there. So you've got to, you all have to agree that this thing happened. Otherwise, you know, you'd have to admit that nothing was happening. So you got to you know, got to go along, go, go with the flow. Why is it that children like to expose themselves to something that's frightening like that? Is it exposure yeah. therapy? Is it something that you would recommend for ch children? You know, it's, it's a really interesting question because both of my kids are into what I'll say are spooky things. I mean, we've got all these books around the house, so it's, it makes sense. But my, my smaller one especially is, is only six. But now every night I have to tell her two ghost stories every night and she says they have to be the scariest I can make them and I'm, I'm running out I'll be honest I need more I, I'm going through my books you know as fast as I can I'm like I'm really running out of things I can you know sort of distill down into a five minute story that's not going to be you know terrifying but she likes to say at the end ghosts aren't real so I think there's this you know it, again it's kind of its own little mini play where you know they have different beats to this story where I have to you know say I'm going to tell the story she has to say it's got to be super scary we argue about it I tell the story and then at the end she says it's not real so I guess it gives them that feeling of control over some aspect when you know they're told do you know, go brush your teeth go to bed you know, all those things but at least they get to say ah I but I can decide if that's scary or not and, and then I think in general like one of the big things about about ghost stories especially is you can you can think oh you know dear departed great grandpa is maybe still here doing whatever or he could be a talking mongoose that could be a thing too so it's uh it goes both ways well thank you for being with us today 
tell us where we can find you up especially the beer lady podcast of course thank you it is always a pleasure so yes i can be found uh in any number of places but uh definitely the big thing to, to plug is the the beer ladies podcast you can find us uh all across the the internets uh, on beer ladies pod is, is usually what we are but if you just google beer ladies podcast you'll find a whole bunch of uh, stories out there where sometimes we do sort of debunking like this. We have historical episodes. We have ones where people are just sitting around enjoying things. We talk about different ingredients. We talk about uh, the brewing process. We try to really run the gamut. But Beer Ladies Pod is one place to find us, or I'm just always Lisa Grimm on all the socials, and I can point you in the direction of anything we have recorded for the Beer Ladies Pod or any of our upcoming events. <laughs>